I'm Clint and welcome to Swatches live stream number 61. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the final submissions for the Valkyrie Art Challenge. Now, they've had four weeks to work on this image that, you know, each one we're going to be looking at. And this is the last time we're going to be taking a look at these and we're going to give as best feedback as we can in order to improve the piece and also the, answer the questions and concerns that they have written in on the pieces themselves. Now, I am your host, Clint Curley, illustrator best known for my work with Magic the Dragon. Magic the Dragon, I said it again. <laughs> Imagine the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, thank you for joining in, especially those who are making time to join in live. Uh, double checking my feed, I think everything looks good. Uh, sorry for starting a little late here. I kept getting a lot of dropped frames, and I'm not sure why that was, so I just lowered the... Uh, the settings on some of the video output and hopefully that'll take care of it. Uh, but we got some people in here right now. Uh, Michael, Martin, Will, Anna, good to see everybody. Uh, I like the past work previews you're using for the intro. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's probably one of those things that I'll update the images from time to time, but it's, uh, it's really good for me because it allows me to give a soft open for the live streams. Yeah, when you're doing a lot of takes, uh, so recently I've recorded a new intro for the Swatches Patreon, and when you're doing the intro over and over and over, because you're trying to get a good take, uh, you start flubbing the things that you say, and then you start saying it wrong more than you start saying it right, and then you just can't really stop. <laughs> yeah, Magic and Dragons. Uh, so these are the ones that were sent in. Uh, there were 12 tickets sold for this challenge. Anyone who bought a ticket was allowed to uh, submit their artwork in, and I would review it. Uh, not everyone was able to, just doing to things going on in their life, schedule, health, that sort of stuff. But this is uh, what we've got. So this is what we'll be going through. Uh, to get us going, let's take a look at the brief. This is the... Uh, <clears throat> outline for the challenge that everyone is trying to fulfill and uh, although it was open to being both a valkyrie or an oni hunter uh, we only have valkyrie so that's the title of this vid video is the valkyrie art challenge uh, they were to depict a female valkyrie from norse mythology who has come to take a fallen viking warrior to valhalla she should be beautiful, have armor, helmet, and how she's interacting in the scene, though, was really up to the artist. Is she floating down? Is she picking him up? Uh, is she there in a spirit form? Is she there in a very tangible form? All of that was up to the artists themselves. Also, the nature of the scene. Was it in the middle of a battle, after a battle, young Viking, old Viking? all up to those guys oh how's it going uh we got some more people ronnie good to see you thanks for joining in uh, okay so uh, oh yeah i was i said i was going to kick off the new challenge with i mean the the video with the new challenge so this is the lapse episode for this challenge but we'll be starting a new challenge and if you want to get in on that then tickets will be going on sale. That reminds me I need to go over here. So, the part of announcements is ticket schedule. Uh, it's not real fair for some of my overseas viewers who want to be in part of the challenge for all the tickets to go on sale when they're asleep. So, tomorrow about midday, I will be putting up half the tickets, which is six of them up for sale uh, then about 12 hours later sometime around midnight i will be putting up the remaining six tickets uh, so that those who are awake on the other side of the world have a chance to purchase those uh, i will try to let you know the exact times i don't know yet i'll have to set it up on the gumroad store but uh, i can put that in here if you want to go purchase one that is on gumroad uh, dot com slash I think it's slash swatches and then it will be for purchase up there 
Okay, uh, patreon.com slash swatches. If you want to be learning from me and the new materials that I put out, then join me over on the Patreon. Uh, I am going to be pushing to get a new video out on painting materials uh, by the end of the month. Uh, you will need to be pledged by the end of the month and it will come out uh, right after Patreon uh, processes pledges on the 1st of August, on the next, you know, the 1st of the month. So you will need to be pledged by then to get that. Yes, it will be available for individual purchase after that, but it will be at a higher price. So if you want to get the best deal, make sure you join me over on Patreon. Uh, we have two groups, the Swatches group, Art Group, and the Vibrance Group, where we focus on the habits, health, and attitudes that help us get ahead in life and pursuits. Those are the addresses, swatches.group and vibrance.group. And of course, if you want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video consultation with me, you can do that on artmentor.com. Make sure you don't forget the hyphen. And there is some more information out there. We can go over whatever you need to. And you can schedule a time with me on the Calendly link. It will send you over my Calendly page. And I have times on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings that I am open to doing that. Uh, also, if you are joining me live in the chat and you want to throw me a question or if I'm reviewing your image during this program and you have some comments or questions to toss to me, uh, make sure you're doing that with uh, starting your comment with swatches, the word swatches. So we'll flag it in yellow and it is easier for me to see. Oh, Anna, you're still sick. Uh, something ought to be done about that. Man, I hope you start feeling better. Uh, Martin says, prove so much with these challenges. You are improving, Martin. You're doing really good. I uh, appreciate you sticking around, and I'm glad you feel like you're making some improvement. Uh, William, too, has been putting in a lot of time, I can tell. Okay, so that's enough for announcements. Let's go ahead and jump into the new challenge, and then we will take a look at the other one. So the new challenge, I did not put a poll out. For the last two challenges, I've been putting out a poll and letting you guys vote on what you wanted to do. I was kind of lagging behind, didn't put one together. So what I did is I grabbed the runner-up from the last poll, and I made that one option. And then I've created a new one for the second option. And we'll do the two-option thing again. I think people like that. So <clears throat> here we go. This is the Kinslayer Odru, or the Sword and Owl Challenge. Choose either the Kinslayer or Odru Challenge. Both are full-color illustrations. Kinslayer is an item. So, Kinslayer, Blade of the Warlord. Depict the legendary weapon of the Frost Giant Warlord. Image should show the sword free-floating in front of the cold northern landscape. The sword is a meld of enchanted ice in either iron antlers or iron thorns. Handle is wrapped with leather and may be stained with blood or show markings, runes, that sort of thing. The blade should be broad, uneven, and the entire appearance impressive, fierce, and brutish. Image should be an MTG or Hearthstone style. Or you can choose Odru, Lord of the Owls. Show the majestic giant Odru, Lord of the Owls. Approach is broad on this image. Sorry, <clears throat> I need to drink something. <clears throat> this one's pretty broad. I just want to make sure that the Lord of the Owls is the main subject. A couple of ideas. He could be a benevolent forest spirit, a la, you know, Studio Ghibli who is speaking or giving audience to some human. It could even be in a Ghibli style. That's fine for this one as well. He could be a crown-wearing king receiving offerings from other owls. Perhaps he's a mysterious presence watching the ancient woods that are shrouded in mist, almost like some sort of character out of you know, Lord of the Rings. Consider what you can do to convey his size and unique appearance. The style is open. Anything from a stylized fairy tale to a realistic approach is acceptable. And these can be either vertical or horizontal images. And if you purchase the ticket, then you will have access to 
the uh, POST files and all the templates for setting that up. Now, if you are interested in doing this challenge, but you do not have the money or desire to actually purchase a ticket, and you just want to do it for the fun of it, then I will have a link where you can download this outline and the PSD files for laying out all of your stuff and the reference or inspiration images will all be available and you will be welcome to go out there and download that. That will be on the Swatches Facebook group. Okay, so uh, some uh, images that I put together that I downloaded to give you an idea of what I'm thinking about is here on the left side you see Odru, the owl. Over here you see blades, ideas for the Kinslayer. So the owl could be a giant one like this, some sort of uh, almost spirit-like sort of creature of, of massive, massive size. Uh, maybe he's a big round guy like that, big bushy eyebrows, that's kind of cool. This one's really neat, all dark and, you know, phantom-like, that's cool. Uh, I love this style. If you wanted to go with more of a traditional style, more line art, this is a really good one for that as well. And also just how can you push him to be a little different than a normal owl? I think that's a neat approach. Maybe he's a darker creature, even though he is the king. He's kind of a, um, you know, a bit of a legend. Or, you know, just uh, which type of owl, barn owls, snowy owls, that sort of thing, all up to you. Uh, different ideas of the Kinslayer. We don't do many items. Uh, and that's one of the things I was trying to get away from on this particular challenge is we've been doing a lot of characters over and over and i know if i toss the question to you guys you are invariably going to choose characters and there's nothing wrong with characters but i do want a little variety and also give some of the other people a chance who like painting other things so uh the item isn't something we do very often and it gives us the chance to really focus on some cool designs and also rendering of uh, particular uh, materials like the icy appearance or magic effects that sort of thing uh, we got a question from will that says uh, does he have to be an owl he's not a human who has the title lord of the owls no very much animal no uh, the whole point here is moving it away from the human so he might have some human characteristics like the way that he's you know kind of emoting or gesturing but he does need to be very owl yeah uh the blade itself uh some sort of icy blade uh using like iron thorns wrapped around it or there's uh you know iron antlers or antlers covered in iron that the blade is grafted to um, something on those lines. Maybe the ice glows. Uh, maybe there's runes in it. Uh, you know, this sort of thing's pretty cool down here with like, oh, wrong button. Oh yeah, I'm not in Photoshop. That won't work. <laughs> I have to scroll like this. Okay. Uh, you know, this sort of thing with leather wrappings around on it. Uh, maybe it has bits of iron in it that give it a little structure, anything like that. Uh, these are some great pieces by Chris Ron here and here these were done for magic the gathering and he does multiple like swords of war and peace feast and famine that sort of thing and this is sort of background i'm talking about uh it's fairly nondescript it just sets a general location most of the time the colors are more subdued and the values are more subdued allowing the uh, sword to stand out well and we're looking for that sort of thing uh, but we're not having the arm i just I just need the, the sword itself just kind of floating there. So uh, any questions on that, you're welcome to toss them to me. I'll try to address those in case I forgot to list something. Uh, yes, I think it's great to have one character and one prop or similar. Uh, this way, is, yeah, everyone's happy. Yeah, going forwards, also I'm considering doing one where it is like one is traditional, one is not. Uh, one's digital, one's traditional or even doing uh, concept pieces. So like on one challenge, it is to do, you know, three different concepts of the same thing. So we're looking at some variety going forwards with that. Uh, Martin says, I have to uh, come back to my studies of anatomy and color, but I will try to find time to make one of them. Awesome, good, good. 
Uh, is there a place where I can find the previous challenge sheets? Uh, yes and no, question mark. Uh, you can, okay, if you go to the Facebook page, uh, you can click on any post that has my name, and then it will show you a list of all the posts that I have posted. And you can look at the ones that have been, uh, you know, that I've posted in the past. So you don't have to see everybody's posts. You can just look at my post, and they will be in there. But I will pull together the ones that I have quick access to. I'll try putting those in a folder and posting those out on the, uh, the group so that you can download those if you'd like. Okay. That'll do it for that. Uh, I wonder if I could grab some other image that... Oh, yeah, this one. I came across this. Uh, I don't remember. Where, oh, Pinterest. So whoever this is did that. Uh, this sort of thing, too, where if you want to dress them up and they have some sort of cloak or armor or anything on that range, that would be fine, too. Uh, so, again, like, not human, but you can give some human characteristics like that, like they're wearing, you know, different kinds of clothes, that sort of thing. Hmm. Uh, was there anything else I forgot on that? No, I think that pretty much does it. Uh, and Pinterest is a really good resource for those. Oh yeah, this is another one I'm thinking about doing in the future, is one that has uh, some sort of mechanized, uh, you know, design of, of I want to say a creature or a character, but a machine. Yeah, I came across some of this Dark Age uh, images, and these are really nice and, and great textures, good design, uh, some cool little lighting things going on too. So I think those would be a good challenge. So I'm keeping that in mind going forwards. Okay, so first up, just going alphabetically, and a Remtke. Uh, some of these I have done some paint overs. Some of them uh, I've just done lines. So you, you get what you get. Uh, I tried to put more effort into some that I thought were maybe going to be more applicable to more people. So there we go. Okay, so starting off here, uh, she says she was uh, sick. Uh, no, I believe, Anna, you're in the chat. Yes, okay, so Anna is in here live with us. Uh, Anna was still sick, so she didn't get as much done as she had hoped for. You did get a lot done. And, you know, this, this is not a professional piece, so definitely prioritize getting you healthy before uh, making it worse by trying to finish this challenge. You can always come back and put more time into this, so make sure that you're not making it worse just to try to finish this piece. Uh, try to imply as much as I could from the tips you gave me. You did. I, I think you did good bringing in a lot of those suggestions and melding those into the new concept. Uh, this is still a work in progress, but I hope you can still critique it. I'm struggling with the blue light on her armor, skin, and hair, and with connection, the characters with the background. Uh, by now, it looks like they don't belong together. Other issues are materials and design of clothing. Okay, so let's step through some of that. Number one, the blue light. And this, I'm sorry, that drink is carbonated and it's making me want to belch. <clears throat> okay, so the blue light here, Anna, is really a artist call about um, how strong you want that to be. So I'm assuming that you're wanting it more powerful than it is right now. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's wrong right now, but it's perhaps underutilized, and we can definitely make it stronger and give it a more of a, a blue presence. Uh, what we had talked about was kind of anything in inside this closed area with the two of them would be more heavily blue, and almost everything else in the scene would be more uh, warm-based, kind of separating the two of them, so that they were the main two that are um, you know, influenced by this blue spirit light. So, uh, okay, so I'm going to kind of talk about kind of both of them at the same time, and I'm going to pull this over. No, no, I don't need Creative Cloud right now. Thank you. I'll pull this over here so you can see that. There we go. I didn't know if that was quite on the screen or not. 
Um, I would start by trying to make that even more clear about, you know, blue and then warm. And one of the ways that we're going to really connect foreground and background, and this goes for practically every image. This is a good thing to keep in mind. If you want to make th things look like they're actually existing in the same universe, uh, in the same place, then make sure that the lighting is interacting on each other in a uh, realistic way, or not even realistic, but make sure the lighting of one thing is affecting another thing, or the cast shadow from one thing goes on to another thing in the scene. So the warm light that's going on back here with the flames of the fire, let them be playing off of this character more, let it be playing off of her more, uh, then let some of the blue light you know, affect them as well. But the interaction between the two of those is going to be what really pulls the two of them together. And we also want to play with the value scheme a bit. So if I were to make, uh, no, let's do this another way. And of course, Anna, you know, if you want to toss me uh, comments during this, just feel free. So right now, the value scheme is kind of getting broken up with the background getting really light and dark around the character. So let's try to shorten that down a bit so maybe it doesn't get quite so dark and leave most of the darks for the foreground. So I went in with a overlay layer, and an overlay is great for adding color or adjusting color while also slightly adjusting the value at the same time. So I just used some orange and blue, and you can see flipping that on and off, that it just saturates those up. I just wanted to make it more clear. I'm going to punch it up with a bit more color. Maybe we can dial it back a bit later, but for then, uh, there was nothing on that layer. Okay. And that just pulls that up a bit. Next up, I have a lighten layer to 64%. And I just throw that over the background characters. I'm trying to mute them down a little bit so that they are, uh, they're, the darkness isn't quite competing as much with some of the foreground elements. And then this is uh, just a normal layer uh, doing some of the paint over and addressing some of the things that you're talking about. So let's pull in here. Now, I don't know exactly what you meant by you're struggling with the blue light, uh, just, I guess, how it's kind of working. But let's start with the metal here on, like, the breastplate area. That the metal is going to have a tendency to be more uh, contrasting. So the lights are going to be more light, and the darks are going to be more dark, and it's going to be more dynamic with a wider range. And whatever it is, it's usually going to be a very much that. So here we have this very gradual, you know, I'm going to use this layer here with a little brush. Here we have a very gradual change from like, you know, bluish up to kind of brown. And I think this is supposed to be metal, but this is behaving more like skin, maybe leather. Maybe it's supposed to be leather. I'm not sure, but I, I have a feeling it was supposed to be metal. When I put the blue light on things, it starts looking muddy always. Oh, uh, okay, okay, I follow you. Uh, I, I hear where you're coming from on that, and that's usually because you're not committing to it. And it can feel wrong to paint something so blue, but that's kind of what you need to do. Or you do it like this, where it's very distinctly like this side is blue, and uh, then you have the dark mid, right? So these, this is basically going to be acting as a mirror. Anything facing upwards is going to be reflecting the sky. Anything facing downwards is going to be reflecting the blue. Uh, then the mid is going to be reflecting whatever the distance is in, you know, behind the viewer, which is basically going to be dark because there's, there's no direct light source there. And uh, so anything facing up is going to be very warm. And everything facing down is going to be very blue. And you just kind of commit to that. 
And there's nothing wrong with that because skin tone can be any color that you want it to be just given the proper light. Uh, so here, I mean, I think that light, it doesn't bother me. Things, um, yeah, I think what you're doing is you're having like warm skin tone and then you're getting blue and you're kind of, you're glazing it over with blue. And so what you have is when you get something warm, and then on this side you have something blue, and then you're like, I want it to be, have the blue light on it. Well, you didn't make blue, you just made gray, all right? Because the blue and the, and the warm orange together are just gonna cancel each other out and make gray, which sometimes is the exact color that you need. But I'm gonna say, if it's over here on this side, don't be afraid. Just, just make it blue. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. It, that is literally the main or and almost only light source in the scene. So, just feel free to commit to it and make it that color. A uh, small lighting change I would suggest is adjusting it so that this becomes silhouette and this becomes more lit. So down here. We can simplify the scene by letting this basically go into silhouette. Uh, then the orange light uh, from back over there kind of highlights these shapes. Uh, then the blue light is far less powerful. And that allows our attention to go to the things that are more well lit with the blue light. Uh, so some things are, you know, left a bit more to the silhouette. And some of the bright light is catching along the side of this fellow. I, did, I just roughed it in. You'd probably want to do a better job than that. But I roughed that in. And you might have some, some other little objects or, or bodies or something. Kind of in the mid-ground between him and those guys back there. Uh, put it in there like that. Uh, something that wasn't really defined was the uh, the light up here. It wasn't really warm or cool. And I feel like it probably should be one or the other. I would choose to go with the cool since it's a connection to the spirit. And so I chose to go with uh, a cool light up there and then allowing the, uh, the wings to be, I mean, you know, more influenced by that. Uh, okay, some of the stuff did a little little work up here on the face. Uh, here are the faces getting really contrasting, and it might be that way depending on how bright your spirit is, but taking some artistic license, uh, I would rather see the skin have a little less contrast so that the metal feels more metallic because the skin almost has the same amount of contrast as the metal, and it makes the skin almost look slightly metallic. Uh, Anna says... How would you go about the spirit's hand? I didn't have the time to get to it yet. Uh, well, I assume that he's, let's see, he's reaching over. Uh, he, okay, he's reaching up with that hand. I would have the two of them actually starting to, to grasp, you know, like this, you know, grasping around each other's wrist and you could just use the uh that is not what i meant to click i meant to click over here no turn that on okay good <laughs> uh and go ahead and have you know you take a picture because that's kind of complicated with the ways that the hands and the wrist work each other but he's doing that So go ahead and have his, you know, hand coming up here and going around her wrist. And you can have her hand, you know, coming around here and wrapping around his wrist the other way. Look, as she's going down. Yeah. We probably want to redo her hand. So that's wrapping around his wrist. They're, they're making a connection there. And you could consider inversing it. Uh, sometimes when you're doing spirits, then what you want to do is... You actually want to brighten up the edge. So let's uh, take away some of this stuff. Uh, what you want to do is brighten up the edge of it. 
Uh, it's like a photo negative. And the middle gets the most see-through. You can do a sort of thing where the top actually catches light as if it were opaque. Yeah, it gets to almost like you're painting, you know, some sort of glass. Uh, but what you can do is then come in here and do like, soften out some of the edges and give like a spirit uh, kind of flow or, or mist to it to keep it from looking glass-like. Uh, but what that means is like if you're coming up to say that you're going to do her hand that way, you would paint it in a sort of a, you know, a blue tone. And then you would get your most bright version. And then like the tips of the fingers would be bright. And the edges, because if you were to look at a cylinder, I know I'm spending a long time on this, but it's one of those things that I have been asked about before and I haven't taken that much time to explain. So you have a cylinder that has stripes coming down it. It's going to appear like the stripes are bigger, you know, in the front. Uh, then they're going to be more stripes on the sides. Let's say I make more of them. Now the stripes are going to be really close there. Uh, then they're going to get wider. Uh, then they're going to get closer and essentially the same thing is going on with this where you're seeing the most stuff at the edge because it's all rounding together and then the stuff in the middle not so much because you're seeing straight through it instead of along the edge and you're glowing uh look at my piece of jace and I did glowing hands on that one. It's the same sort of effect. Uh, that's how I'd suggest doing it. Yeah, uh, Jace, Jace, is, Jace is on map. What was it called? They always rename it when it comes out, and I forget what the new ones. Uh, Jace's Ruse, R-U-S-E. Yeah, uh, I did... Uh, spirit hands on him so it same sort of effect uh but the hands grasping uh this is a good piece anna you should be proud of this a lot of work going into this um what else do you say connecting the kids by now it looks uh, i think most of the character design is working pretty well and i would register her as valkyrie uh this piece feels like it's perhaps too small the shoulder piece, I'd, I'd probably size that up a little bit. Uh, you mean for the ghost hand, not her? Yeah, i make his hand glowing hand, but hers could be like normal. But it's the, you know, the two of them locking together. Yeah, I might size that up a little bit. It seems a little dainty there. Uh, also, the way that the arm is coming forwards doesn't seem quite right like it doesn't feel like this shoulder is actually coming forwards because it seems like it would be compressing that upper part of the body so if you don't have a reference for that uh you know, like that i'm looking at your ref there but i don't know it's feeling a little off to me okay one of the things that's probably getting me is like you have the chest completely sideways, like flat, but the shoulders have this distinct angle to them. And the breasts are always gonna follow the angle of the shoulders. 
because you don't get an angle change until you get to the bottom of the rib cage. Everything on the rib cage is going to always follow the shoulder angle. Uh, you only get a little bit of change if like the arm is really raised. It's going to pull the skin up and that can change the angle a little bit, but that's not really what we got going on here. Were well, the shadows on her wings too high? Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, there's a lot of wiggle room there. If you're talking about are they too dark? No, I think they're about right. You might just go with more saturation. They're not very saturated right now. And you have the option to use something really warm or really cool. And instead, you're, you're playing around in the gray tones. So, like down here, if we look at this angle, the breasts need to follow that same angle. And right now, they're kind of doing like this horizontal thing. Uh, yeah, he could be the same way with the, the magic glow where it's bright on the edges and a little uh, more transparent in the middle. Uh, I would suggest going out and taking a look at like ghosts, uh, illustrations, um, magic, you know, things being summoned, that sort of thing. Okay, I've got to wrap it up there. We've got to move on. Uh, and I hopefully find that helpful. You're doing a, a wonderful piece here. And when you start feeling better, I look forward to seeing, you know, how you finish it up. Uh, one more question, and I am bad at thinking in 3D and couldn't do the top of her left shoe right. Can you hint how you would fold it around? Top of her left shoe. Uh, probably with a photo. <laughs> um, if you're having a hard time figuring out something like a shoe, it's, it's a simple fix. Just take a picture, look in a mirror. Uh, it's not one of those things that really you need to guess at very much because there's an easy way to figure it out. Um, I know that we want to sometimes just think through everything. Uh, I, I have a tendency to do that, but one of the ways that I get faster over the years is setting aside my pride and just going, I know how I can find the answer to this within two minutes, so why don't I just go do that? <laughs> That's what I'm going to suggest. Uh, yes, uh, Brandon's right. Uh, in MTG, uh, there was a lot of spirits that you can find in the Innistrad sets. And I'm trying to think of one in particular. Yeah, nothing comes to mind immediately. Okay, so next up is uh, Anna Maria, who has another Valkyrie image. Um, and we're going to start by taking a look at some of the comments that she makes. First of all, I've been ill. What is with the Annas being sick? Ladies, I'm sorry. I hope you, you both start feeling better. Therefore, this is pretty much how I would have uh, wanted to return to it in the sketch phase. Uh, I spent most of my time struggling to get the lighting right, and I'm pretty happy with the horse. However, I've tried uh, pretty much every color for the Valkyrie's dress. have no clue what to do with it. I thought about it being white but couldn't figure out what color to make it to make it white uh haven't done much work on the foreground and the valkyrie's armor is not quite right like you didn't want to show that much leg okay uh, so uh anna maria this is this is a lovely piece and we had talked about doing a very high key image um, let's pull up here. This is an example of a high key image. That is the values are all very high. Most of it sits around the mid tones to the uh, light tones. And that can be a very difficult thing to pull off. It's a, it's a tricky way to do a piece. And so I get that you haven't finished the image and maybe it's not as developed as you would like, but this is time really well spent and it is there's a lot to be learned from handling a value and color scheme like this so whether you even finished this piece or not i think that it's been well worth your time 
and I applaud you for for giving it a shot. So Anna Maria's also here in the chat. Awesome. Uh, no, don't worry about the the longer comment. That's good. I, anything more than that might be a little much, but that's okay. Uh, then you're also talking about the anatomy. Yeah, we'll we'll hit on that as well. So first thing I want to talk about uh, the lighting being right. I think you have an excellent uh, direction on the lighting. Yeah, it can be it can be adjusted some, and we can carry it through a bit more. But I think you're approaching it very well. It is one of those things that it doesn't need to be a hundred percent accurate. Like if you were to take a photo, how you know would it look like this? It just needs to be mostly accurate because at this point, it's very illustrative, and you just you're trying to make something beautiful that has mostly consistency to it and that's and that's fine so carrying that through is the main thing number two uh, pretty happy with the horse so am I uh, horses can be quite difficult to do uh, you've got a good reference here now I'm talking to people quite a bit about proper use of reference this is a good use of reference you can see what she did here was she found a pose that she really liked, but it's not the lighting or the colors that she liked. So she used basically this pose, this horse, with this sort of lighting and colors and combined the two to being something that is really beautiful. And it has the believability of the horse, but it also has the kind of the creativity of being its own thing at the same time. Uh, Will says, Swatches, how do you handle whites such as a dress or wings when you're dealing with light and color from environment and still have to read as white to the viewer? Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is white is a chameleon and it will take on the color of whatever the light source is or whatever the surrounding dominant colors are. It has no color in itself. So any white facing up at a blue sky is going to be blue. Any white facing a red wall is going to be red. It will take on whatever color that the light bouncing on it is going to give it. And also remember that it's usually not white in value. That it is going to have some value to it. Um, and that it's all relative. The big thing to keep in mind with painting white is that the thing doesn't need to be white. It just needs to be white relative to the other colors in the scene. Let's take a look at this photo of this white horse. All right, I'll use my color sampler and click it right here. That's white. Of course, that's not white. It's gray, but it registers as white to us we would say that's white you would say that that is white there's lots of colors in here and you would define them all as white it's not because that color is in itself white it's just that color is white compared to the rest of the colors in that particular lighting and shading scenario and that's why i always say that no color is right or wrong or defined it's just right or wrong depending on how it relates to all the other colors um, if you know this if this was you know this orange then that wouldn't you wouldn't say that that's a white horse you would say that's like you know a tan horse a peachy horse However, if I were to tint the entire thing, then you would still register that as a white horse because it's still relatively what would be white compared to everything else. Uh, but yeah, it can be tricky uh, because it's one of those things that your mind wants to say, no, it's white, it can't be that dark. Uh, but I remember a good example in James Gurney's book, and he shows 
uh, I don't have a picture of it, but he shows a, I think he's sitting there with a black t-shirt on, holding a newspaper, and there's a light coming down on him. And the, if you look at the actual values and judge the values, the black t-shirt under sunlight is brighter than the underside of the white newspaper in the shadow. Black in sunlight is brighter than white in shadow. I mentioned this sort of contradiction in my Art Fundamentals Values episode where a checkered board, a, the black square of a checkered board in the sunlight is the same value as the white checkered board square in the shadow. Uh, and that's where it starts getting really confusing because it, it was counter to what your logical brain wants to accept. But moving on, we got to move on. <clears throat> so, horsey. Horsey's good. I uh, like white. So let's step through some of this. Now, this was a good example uh, for a reference. So I would get something like this and I would adjust the values so that it matched the values and the colors that I would be using in my scene so that I would have a pure, more accurate uh, reference to play off of. And then I can just sample off of this sucker and have very accurate colors. I'll probably still tweak them a little bit, but that keeps one level of guessing out of it. So I'm just moving up the midtones on that and bringing in a little bit more of the color, running up the saturation a little bit. And now those are really close to each other and you wouldn't have to be guessing as much. Okay, so looking at the anatomy of the character, we talked a bit about the pose and her feeling a bit off a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I would check is the legs, starting with the legs. And that if you ever rode a horse, you realize that you're, you're riding a barrel. You know, the horses, they're, they're very broad and your legs go out at a very steep angle. Um, it's not like riding a bike, you know, where your legs are very close together. So I think one of the things that we're missing is the fact that her legs are gonna be coming at us a lot more than they're gonna be coming down. So I would suggest thinking about that. And then we're moving this tube shape up from coming down here to being more up here, maybe even higher. It might be coming at us up higher even more. Uh, then the leg is going to be buckling around that shape. Again, it's not coming straight down. You kind of have it coming like it's just hanging down. But I'm feeling like it's probably going to pull back a little bit other than the, you know, more like that. And then the upper body right now you have along this line. And I think that's pretty close. But... I I was sitting down, I sat on the edge of the bed, kind of put my legs around the corner and then try to get in that in pose. And when I get in that pose, I feel like my body is behaving slightly different than that. And I would adjust it a bit because when I do it, I feel like I'm dropping that shoulder even more. And then that other hand goes much higher naturally if i drop down that one shoulder that back hand goes up a lot more than where her arm is just straight out to the side and then my chin gets a lot closer to that shoulder as i turn my head into my shoulder so take a photo just have someone sit on a chair you know going across wide on the chair and try to take someone you know a photo of someone in that pose because it's a difficult one and you also have to decide whether or not she is arching her back like this, which I think she would, or whether she's arching her back like this, whether she's hunching over to reach. And that's drastically going to change the two. Uh, something to remember, too, is she might be sitting lower on the horse because right now the horse back is doing that and she's sitting right on it, where in actuality you tend to sit a bit deeper on the horse. Uh, no, I know, wrong layer. Okay. You're probably going to sit a bit deeper 
and your you know your butt's going to flatten out a little bit as it cushions you on the horse so you're going to appear to be sitting down a little bit into and then the upper body would need to adjust to follow that now the you know the back's getting too long so we're going to be getting you know more of this sort of thing something on that line um Anna says, uh, you make it look so easy. That sketch looks so much more natural. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? Um, I didn't have a reference, so it's not accurate, accurate. But just getting in that pose and just feeling what your body's doing and then trying to keep that in mind as you look at your image and feel like, just feel what the, you know, kinesthetics is, the, the way that your body is moving and also just you know i've tried to draw people on horses before and there's a couple of things that i remember so there you go <laughs> um so like that um the, the helmet is a little odd i'm assuming you're designing a helmet that goes over the eyes um and not just the, the tilt is that way so i i think the helmet probably needs a bit of a, a redesign just to make it really clear that that's what you're going for um, take a look at the re the design for the female thor uh, comic character when what's her name becomes thor and she has a really cool helmet that has a low cut to it like that essentially you're doing the same thing without the eye holes so uh, you take a look how they they render that yeah, over the eyes and nose, and, and that's fine, but we probably need it to have some angle changes. So when it comes here, like having it come more like Batman, right? It comes here, and then it kind of follows the, the shape of the nose and then the cheeks. So it's really clear that that's the shape that it's following and not just one curve. Uh, and then make sure we get in the mouth in there so that's clear as well. Okay, uh, what else are we talking about? Uh, upper, lower, uh, over the leg. Now, on a scene like this where you're doing a higher key image and it's all about the color, uh, a really good friend of yours is going to be Mr. Overlay Layer. So, tossing that on here, this is a good way to bring out some color. Right? Uh, let's just do one from scratch new layer overlay because overlay is going to be doing a really good job of bringing in and adjusting colors in the midtones and that's about all you've got midtones so it's going to work exceptionally well so i can pick a color like you know some sort of purpley color and then i'm going to turn on my color dynamics on my brush so color dynamics are about here you can set it for whatever you want and oh, need something a bit lower. So color dynamics is going to give me some hue and saturation jitter. So everything isn't exactly the same. And then I can just paint over this and it's going to keep most of the values intact while throwing in some extra color into it. And I can do the same thing with, you know, some of the uh, gold tones. So I wanted to warm those up some. I can just throw in all kinds of colors. If you want to come up here with a bit more of the you know, kind of the violets and let those blend together. And if you don't want it super strong, then, you know, set the saturation down a little bit. Just let it play with some of the colors uh, without it being, you know, all the color. So those can be really good uh, in order to play around with uh, color options and bringing in more vibrancy and stuff. And the other thing I want to talk about is um, this bright sort of backlighting and... A quick way to kind of rough this in 
is to have a new layer we can pick out, you know, like a bright light. And then coming down here to outer glow. When outer glow, we want to set that to color dodge. I mean, linear dodge. Pick like a deep orange and set that saturation up. And now you see over here, it has this nice glow around the edge of it. We can turn off the outer glow. So the normal stroke is just kind of whitish. And then the outer glow gives it that nice brightness. Now we see what we can do with that. We don't actually need that right there. Oh, we got a bunch of new people in here. Very cool. Marionette, welcome. Thanks for joining the channel. This is the first thing I'm watching from you, but wow, you're amazing. Art clearly, keep going. Well, thank you. Uh, stick around. We're going to be uh, going over some more stuff. We've got some more paint over stuff to talk about too. And if you have questions, toss them to me. This is the uh, time to take them. So now that we have our you know bright light layer, we could even set that to a linear dodge if we wanted to. And I'm going to pick a nice kind of golden color. Then I can come in here and just say, oh, I just want bright edge light on this. And then this automatically brings in that beautiful glow. I've used this quite a few times. And I wouldn't say that this is final. It's fine for concept art if you want to just bring it up to that level. But you probably want to come back and, and finesse this with some individual, you know, brush strokes and maybe add a little variation in there. But for a quick to do, uh, it can work quite well uh, to giving you the, the basic idea of how it works. And like, you know, here, this sort of thing, well, we actually want to make sure that we're using the lighting to help tell more of the form. Instead of just running a line along the edge, uh, over here, you know, this is a really good one to learn from. Is that that edge isn't just a line. That edge is tracing the shape, telling you more about the three-dimensional form of how it falls over some forms very thinly. Other ones, fat is rounded around. Some of them, there's more glow because it's softer. Other parts, you know, it's harsher because it's more... Uh, planar. It's like this. This is harsh because that's basically a flat plane on the hips. So over here, you know, we want to come down here and maybe use this in order to help tell some of the shapes of those muscles. Maybe, you know, along this area, it, it rounds around more and then more planar across there. Maybe this uh, leg back here is catching some light. You know, just being able to play with it like that. And this is also a good way that you can come in here with you know, a small brush and hit you up some individual strands, make those really pop. You could use your uh, multi one. So something on that lines, and you can see you can just quickly, uh, you know, kind of play with that. I've been watching your channel a lot, uh, a lot by the way, love your how-tos. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for watching. Yeah, um, I'm really hoping to be able to do the, the materials video. I've been meaning to do one for the longest time, um, of course coming out on the Patreon. And I purchased multiple how to paint material videos and I was watching those to see you know, what some of the other guys approach is. And I gotta say, I found most of them very underwhelming. Um, so I'm, I'm really thinking this one should be pretty good uh, from just the way that I, I plan to approach it. 
And yeah, yeah, it, it's one that I think that we're the, the industry could really use. So. Uh, Ennis says, also has a bunch of high quality educational materials on his gum road. I purchased all of it. Oh, you're just talking about me. Okay. So it flag swatches because you said the word. Uh, oh, yeah. And if you want more in depth video anal uh, image analysis, where it's kind of like this, but more so, then those are on the video library on the uh, Patreon. So, you know, if you're at the $20 tier or higher, this isn't just supposed to be a big ad for the Patreon, but Patreon literally does support this channel, so it kind of is. Oh, yeah, one of the other things I was thinking about on this, uh, I didn't make a note of it, but the hair coming down the front sort of com dampens the feeling of motion. So I would suggest removing those and letting the hair be flying around. Right, doing this sort of thing, like this here. It's in the middle of all this movement of being tousled around and uh, streaming behind her, right? Uh, and that would be better than letting it just kind of limply be setting here on the front. And we could also get a better silhouette of her body if we got that hair out of the way and we can more clearly see her arm and her chest through here as she's sitting on the horse. Uh, then that hair can be kind of flying out behind and maybe some of the hair you know is catching light back there as it's kind of flying around uh, we could get some good good pops of orange back here from that as well yeah let's see uh anything else i was meaning to go over on this um oh as far as like the design of you know the the clothing i mean that's really up to you uh one of the things to keep in mind is like if we are you know making the hips somewhere around here then any kind of belt is actually going to be running much lower because right now you have this fabric basically coming out from the upper back so you could have the fabric um coming you know more like this or this could even be coming across here. So, you, I mean, you could be covering it up more like that. Or what you see on some designs is like they have the long flowing fabric, kind of what you have here. But you also have uh, a, like a secondary uh, skirt underneath that that sometimes has different designs. So you could have like a secondary skirt that's kind of it probably wouldn't be billowing like that. It would be like caught under there and then it would be kind of billowing up probably. And then it's going to be trying to keep that sort of thing. It's anchored here, so it's going to be blowing off that direction. Or you could do almost like the, the Roman thing where you have, you know, these kind of slats of leather that hang down. Uh, kind of woman... Uh, some of Wonder Woman's designs have that. Like if you were to, you know, look from the front, then it has these individual kind of leather straps, usually with a triangular point on the end hanging down, you know, kind of like person here, like that. Uh, then these could be flopping around as well. So, you know, anything like that would be able to obscure more of the leg if you wanted it that direction. Okay, uh, I, I'm not really going to talk about that. You didn't get to that point. We weren't really addressing it, so I'm not really going to address it either. Um, yeah. Um, I was also going to say that this is pretty cool. I'm not sure where you came across this, but check that out. How cool is that? And whoever did the makeup job on this is really good as well, given that really bronzy skin tone. Uh, melds exceedingly well with this sort of style and meshing in the um, the scales into the multiple pieces this is really really cool it's a, a good reference piece so okay good stuff good stuff got to move on though oh my gosh I really do okay I've got to move a lot faster here I'm just talking too long Okay, this is Brandon Glor. 
Okay. Brandon says, uh, essentially, this was more challenging than I anticipated, uh, especially the triadic color scheme. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, Brandon, if you're not used to doing multiple character scenes that have some sort of narrative with a background, it is difficult. And I, I do not want to downplay that for anyone. Uh, I know that when I went from just sketching, you know, individual characters and little, you know, little individual things to trying to do scenes with multiple people with entire stuff going on, that was a bit of a shock because I thought I knew how to do some stuff until I started trying to put it all together. And that's okay to find it challenging. And the more you do it, the more you'll get to be able to handle it with ease but I just want to say I understand that's okay and it will get easier so uh, first thing just wanted to mention that second thing okay you didn't have any real specific things that you wanted me to talk about uh, you did go back you worked with the color scheme you worked with the value scheme this is more successful. Those are more uh, successful approaches to how to handle those. And I don't, I don't see the triadic color scheme being real strong, but at least you have a direction on it. So let's talk through some of the things that I think would help improve the piece. Uh, first up, let's talk about her pose and kind of what that's saying to the camera. Uh, what I'm seeing here is you've got the Viking fella and he's dying and she's there but what's she doing she's leaning away from him and cocking her head she looks very wary of him not like she's inviting him not that she's being a kind of um, I don't know, comforting angel you know that sort of feeling it looks like she's someone that is worried that she, you know, he's about to bite her, you know? Uh, so what we want to do is instead of her leaning away, we want to lean her to him. That way she's moving in to accept him. And just a real quick, you know, kind of skew there. Uh, if you bring her in like that, it does change the dynamic of how she is perceived. And that would be one of the first changes I would suggest. Next up, uh, three. Uh, and this has to do with uh, just the drawing of this arrow. Uh, both of these arrows are really small. Uh, this is more like a dart than an arrow. Uh, so we want to make sure that these are normal size. And that's something that we're getting... That, that's real loosey in this image is relative sizes. Where this guy feels like he's really big compared to her. Or she's very small compared to him. Or she's... 10 feet away from him. It kind of has to be one or the other because she's nowhere near as big as he is. If we were to grab her and make him so that she was actually near him, where she could almost touch him, she would need to be about that big. Right? Because their heads are, are nowhere near the same size. Right? You can fit about three or four of her heads in his head, and they're only supposed to be maybe four feet apart, which is a huge amount of foreshortening and perspective, you know, diminish uh, for that distance. So we need to adjust the scales of these two so that they are you know, more accurate for each other. And um, you can change one, you can change the other, you can change both, but whichever it is, 
that you choose to do, uh, just make sure that we're getting that correct. Uh, because if they were more close to each other, uh, you could probably get away with something on that line, right? And we probably need like a stone or helmet or something behind him. Because if he's that hurt, he's probably going to try to find something to lean against and not just try to hold himself up. So you just have some rocks and maybe some, you know, grass sticking out or something. So uh, that would be closer to what you would need. And then I would suggest if you're going to go with that, then you just crop in on the whole image and you don't need as much stuff out here. You don't need that much wasted canvas. So, okay, uh, that would be another thing is size. Uh, make sure the arrows are the right size. Uh, if you think about it, if you were to use an actual arrow, you're going to pull it out. You're going to pull it back to about here. That means that it needs to be at least the length of your arm, right? Because it's going to go from the handle. It's going to stick out from the handle where you draw the bow. And you're going to pull it all the way back to it's about at your eye. And your arm is going to be for an adult uh, around three feet. That's going to place it around three feet. I'm not an archer, but it seems to be about the length. And yeah, I researched the arrow back end, not the length of the arrow. <laughs> yeah, so if you think... Uh, it is going to reach from about here to here, right? Because if you hold your arm down, it's going to be from about shoulder to a little past your waist. The arrow is going to need to be, you know, that long. And the ends, I mean, the ends are going to be not in significant size. So just scaling that up about three or four times. Okay, uh, number four. Uh, it seems pretty obvious uh, that there is not a reference to the face because the, the perspective and the angle here is really odd. And if I were to trace this, if we just forget all the shadows, the details, all the rest of it. And if I were to draw the features... We look at how much head this guy has for how much face, right? That's the uh, proportions you're running with the head right now. And that, that seems, uh, th you're, that's pushing it. So I think what you're trying to do is get the perspective of the head down, but you're not looking at a, a good reference for that, or at least you don't show one. And the thing is, you can get photos of these little guys, and it's going to give you something pretty close. So, you know, if this is all you're going to be running from, then don't forget to take multiples. Yeah, have one for the general body. Okay, cool. Uh, then have one of the head. Just zoom up on the head. Get the head exactly at the angle you want. And uh, maybe mesh the two of them together. And like on her, um, or actually on both of these, these figures are free to do whatever you want. So light them the way that you want them lit. Don't just get the pose out of it. They can give you some good light and shadow information as well so yeah just I, I mean I've I have a little lamp I don't have it here but I picked up a little lamp from Ikea uh, you can get one at whatever your you know Walmart or whatever but it's got a, a little bendy neck on it. it has a little LED light on the end of it and you can just crank that thing around and put it wherever you want or what you do is you have another phone or flashlight, anything like that. You can just easily light those suckers the way that you want them. And that way we're not having a guess on the lighting as well. 
and we're not having a guess on the uh, the head. So on the head, though, you you're going to be. I mean, you can think about it like oh, reverse that. We can think about it like a you know sphere if you want to think about the cranium that way, and then. I'm not sure what you're trying to get the head to do. I'm trying to think, I, he's not going to be at a big angle. He's going to be at some angle, maybe. Head's going to have some curve to it. It depends, you know, which way you, I have it angled more to our side than I think you you have it on yours. But, you know, that's going to be something more realistic. But there is the fact that you need a better reference for this because this guy's proportions are kind of out of whack all around. Uh, I feel like you started painting this, and I've done it before, and this is one of the reasons I, I think this is what's going on. I think you started painting it and then didn't have or forgot about having a good anatomy drawing underneath it. And as you kept painting it, the proportions started getting kind of wonky. So on this, like if we look at the, uh, the anatomy, I, get, I mean, I suppose the neck's coming down here. We've got the rib cage. We've got the shoulder here. And then that forearm is running all the way down to the joint. I mean, the upper arm. And then we're running here. And then the hips are here. And this is all midsection. And then we've got the thigh to there. And then this is the only distance for the shin. So when we look at the proportions, this is what we're running at. And so we need to double check that. This is an easy thing to, to check with your, your little fella. Make sure that you are uh, getting the right angle. I feel like this angle is too high. Right, when you drop that camera down, when you take that photo, we need to get down almost right at his level. And that's going to get you a lot closer to the anatomy. And, and remember, this is an approximation. This isn't accurate, accurate. This is what, as accurate as they can realistically do for this cheap little guy. Um, this upper arm is getting too long, so we want to make sure that that's shortened up. We're running too long through this midsection. So that needs to be pulled back a bit. Let the thigh be here. And then let the, uh, the shin lengthen out. Because this and this need to be about the same. Right now the uh, upper leg is much longer than the uh, lower leg. So the anatomy, uh, it's not an easy thing. She's looking pretty good. I buy most of her anatomy. Um, I, I think her reference is probably more accurate than uh, what you're using for this fellow and you were trying to make too many adjustments um, on his, but there you go. Uh, anything else I was to hit on this? Uh, number five, the anatomy, number six. Oh, the six on the lighting, it just seems like it's undetermined right now. Like. There is light here on her, but I don't know where that's coming from. I, I, is that this? Because it seems, oh no, it's, uh, I, it's not affecting everything evenly. So like this metal, this metal is going to be warmer because it's lit by very warm light. And this is all going to be warmer. If it's, able to, if it's able to make her that warm and she's further away, it's going to make him very warm. It's going to be even more intense on him. Uh, any of the purple that is lit by the yellow light is not going to be straight purple anymore. So make sure that we're thinking about that sort of thing and bringing that in. 
you can have violet be the the default color in the shadows. Uh, yes, the lighting would be from the spirit. Okay, that's fine, but we need to make sure that it is carried out so that it's consistent. There's three things that you always want to do consistency with the light. That's direction and intensity and color. And right now we're not having that across uh, all the things that's being affected. And we are lo we're not looking for like 75% accuracy is probably fine. It doesn't have to be 100% accuracy. There's some artistic license there. But if that spirit started affecting him, that light, you know. Oops. Yeah, and see now we're going to be getting more of that sort of effect where you're going to want, you're trying to get more of a, uh, like a orange violet sort of color scheme. And that's fine, but I want to run more violet in the shadows. Sorry, when I'm having to kind of concentrate and run through some stuff in my head, I don't talk as much. Uh, but hopefully, you're you're getting something out of it while I'm I'm concentrating there. Uh, so you know, I'm thinking more of that direction gives you the, a you know better sense of the lighting. It's more engaging that way. Uh, I'm pushing it a little far. I don't think you necessarily need to push it that far. That's really bright. But it kind of gives you the, the approach that might work a bit better. So, Okay, wrapping it up there, Brandon. Hopefully you find that helpful. Uh, you're doing a lot of good work on this. It's Like I said, it's a complicated piece. But I'm thinking just nailing the size relation between the two. Double check his anatomy and proportions. Take a couple extra reference photos um, of your little dude or from you know somebody else. Or if you can do a self-timer on your camera, you can pose yourself. And then let's just push the lighting so that it's more engaging and more consistent. And the colors are a bit more vibrant for, for each of your, your main colors. Yep. Uh, yes, the lighting would be uh, from the spirit. Uh, I used way too much gray. I just didn't think to push the colors enough. Yeah, there's nothing wrong. Um, 
Uh, I don't think you were taken this way, but there's nothing wrong with gray. I don't have a problem with gray. Sometimes gray is exactly what you want. But in this case, I don't think that that's what you were going for. So, yeah. Okay, this one is uh, Madao. I don't, I think there was a way to say that. That's not the way that you said. Anyway, um, I, I've got the proper pronunciation of that. But uh, we have those turned on. We'll turn that off. Uh, this one's a, quite a bit different. We got more of a scene, uh, some buildings and stuff going on. Uh, we'll start by taking a look at the comment down here. Uh, she, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the gender, uh, they, said, uh, Gunnar Eriksson was a fierce warrior feared by his allies and enemy. He was known for his ability to deliver death by a large number. During one raid, he heard the first cry of a baby, sound he knew well as he just became a father. His body reacted by instinct and ran into the house, collapsing. Wounded and exhausted, he will die rescuing the people he came to murder. And here we have a fella holding up the building and his, you know, act of altruism has earned him a place in Valhalla and the Valkyrie comes to take him. Okay, so that's really cool and well beyond the scope of what could ever be construed from looking at the image. So this is needs to be a short discussion on narrative of the image. Ideally, well, it is our job that all the major narrative points can be understood through the image without reading any captions. There is no way that I could understand that he had just become a father and that he was the enemy, and that he was trying to save a baby. And so when I look at the image, all I see is a guy is huddling under a rock to get away from a Valkyrie. Yeah. That's what I see. Guy under rock, hiding, cowered away, Valkyrie has come. All right. So we got to think real, real good about how we can convey more of that story without any text. How can you show that to me in picture? And that's kind of a tall order. I've been handed some briefs before that were, you know, along that line, and you just have to sit there and think like how the heck do I convey all of that without writing anything so a couple of thoughts of ideas how you might approach it uh, one is uh, I'm sort of getting these out of order because I, sw I need to talk through some of this um, if you would actually see him saving someone by doing that so if we adjusted his pose and he was, instead of just crunched down and it's on his back, we show him in more of an Atlas carry, right? Atlas carrying the world on his back. He's got his hands up. It looks like he's trying to force it up, right? Because when you've not actually put in your hand and forcing it, it has more of the appearance that you're cowering that you're using that thing for protection. So think about putting one of his arms up and he's straining with not just his back, but his arm as well. If his arm is pushing it, maybe his arm is holding up room for someone and we would have to adjust the layout so that, you know, this arm is up here trying to hold it up and his head is turned up because he's trying to force it this way and his neck is all hulking out strain we've got blood vessels and his biceps don't look at mine they don't they don't show that um he's hulking out and then there's somebody here a little kid 
crawling out. And so he's pushing this stuff out of the way and he's making room for the kiddo to climb out. I'm not drawing a whole kid trying to climb out of here, but the kid's climbing out. Maybe you see another kid behind him. So he's trying to let multiple kids out. So we might have to adjust it a little bit because obviously a baby's not going to crawl out, something like that. You know, Michael suggests what if the baby's in one hand? Yeah, maybe he's stuck his axe here and the axe is holding up on its own momentarily. And he's got one hand, you know, kind of up here. This hand's around here on the baby. And you, his legs are in more position like one knee is kind of up like he's trying to force his way out and right now he's completely static his legs are planted but if his legs want more of an action like he's he's digging with his feet to try to move forwards that would give us more of that um if there was a baby oh i didn't mean to get rid of all that i'm gonna just back up here if there was uh, again, maybe his hands were up here trying to hold this Atlas style. Uh, he's straining. And then there is like the baby basket. And then the mom is over here pulling the basket out while he's holding it up. And they are oblivious to her. Or maybe he sees her but she doesn't because he's so close to death he can see the Valkyrie you know um, when the Valkyrie gets him he should be dying or already died yeah he's, he should be pretty close to being beat you know here uh, so something on that lines we've got to change that around give us more like I do know and I do recognize that you got like the lady back here with the kid but it's too far removed from the story first to know that there was any connection between him and the kid in the building okay so that is a lot of talk about all that let's back up to here number two time management uh i need to work on my time management in fear of failure um uh, but valkyries come when you're dead yeah isn't it problematic when he is fully in action uh, yeah, we're playing a little loose with myth, but it's myth anyway. So maybe I, you know, I'm kind of like maybe on the edge of death. You can, you can see the Valkyrie if you're about to die. So, you know, we're a little loose with it. Uh, time management. A lot of time management is going to come from where are you putting your time? What are you taking your time to render? Taking time to render all the Celtic stuff on here and on here. All of this, not a real good choice for time management. Now this, if you haven't picked it up, go pick up my painting process video. I step through what you need to do at each process. This last stage, that doesn't matter. All of this stuff, all of this stuff, these little symbols, those are not going to make the image. Those are not going to define the image. They're not, they're, they are barely going to move the needle on image where it is to image being complete. What we want to do is focus on the things that are going to move the needle the fastest, uh, then we're going to go to the things that move the needle the next fastest to the next fastest the next fastest and eventually when you finally get to the end little things like adding the runes to the shield are going to be one of the few things that's going to be moving the needle because you've already done everything else so time management is largely going to come from putting the time that you do have into the things that's going to make the most difference okay uh pose uh fear of failure now fear of failure definitely a real thing and one of the biggest things to do with the fear of failure is 
having the proper understanding of what failure is for what you're what you're doing and failure doesn't necessarily mean the image didn't meet the deadline or the image doesn't look the way that you want because it depends on what the goal was if the goal is one thing being a fail it being a failure is completely dependent on that if the goal was to push yourself then it wasn't a failure it was a complete success because i think you really did push yourself if the goal was to get better at showing a more complex narrative scene then this is a success if the goal was to learn and to improve this was a wild success and then once you are comfortable once you have achieved that then you can maybe make the goal doing this great piece but not till then so i think right now is to make sure that you're having the right goal uh, then you will have the right measure of whether it was successful or a failure uh, and i always feel like if you are learning if you are improving then it was successful and that i don't judge a piece on every individual piece but a judge on whether i am moving forwards or not because everybody has good days everybody has bad days everybody has good pieces and bad pieces and while you try to make every piece good um it's kind of like the stock market right you know over time it goes up but it fluctuates up and down as it does so so overall you improve but on a day-to-day -day basis you go up and down i don't you know some of the best pieces i painted were several years ago okay well that, that's fine it fluctuates and the longer you do it the fluctuations get longer so you know maybe you have a good couple of months up and then maybe you have a down couple of months so there we go Next up, uh, talking about the pose. Uh, now let's just talk about some of the rest of the stuff going on here. Uh, this, I feel like, is out of place. Um, I think you're trying to get the wing to wrap around. But uh, I, I'm not getting it. Like, the wing is established as if it's going completely horizontal, you know, perpendicular to us and not that it's wrapping and also if the wing did get around to here that is not the pattern the end of a wing has <laughs> um so uh, let's just get rid of that that's that's not helping a lot uh if we're going to do anything there which we probably do need something there just to keep the eye uh, we can just have a uh we can just have like a, a piece of you know smoldering timber with some smoke coming off of it kind of sitting there maybe there's some more tinder uh timber you know kind of stuck up there or sticking out and then that just keeps us out of this corner from our eye going off of there uh the rest of this is you know workable it doesn't need to be much it's kind of what you got it's just you need to show ruin and stuff um Yeah, this is also something that feels like it's not actually down on him. I feel like there's space here. And uh, this kind of needs to be reworked so that it feels like it's, it's tighter down on him. Mm. Yeah, like these guys, they're... they're You've got some good direction here. I, I think you're approaching it the right way. Like the amount of motion that you get out of this face when it's coming up at you like that, that's really good. Uh, the strain on this dude, yeah, you know, we want to we want to punch it up with that sort of thing. And 
Yeah, I, I think that's good for now. Um, we talked about a lot of stuff, and I think we talked about the stuff that's going to matter the most right now. And going forward, we can talk more about color and lighting and that sort of thing, but that's not the major issue that's worth talking about right now. So, out of work. Martin Roca. Uh, solid, solid piece here, Martin. Uh, doing good stuff. So, uh, questions, comments. He says, hi, Clint. This took me around 40 hours to make. I'm quite concerned about my speediness, and I think that that is because of my lack of confidence along the process. How is the best way to improve my timing? Okay, so... Uh, Martin, 40 hours for this piece is not unreasonable. Uh, you probably feel like that's slow, but that's not really that slow. That's a week, so it took you, it took you the better part of a week to do it. That sounds about right. Um, I think one of the biggest, um, I want to say misunderstandings or um, myths that a lot of people have is how long it takes to do some images. And when you're getting into a piece where you have this much clarity, this much detail, this much design, this much uh, complex lighting, and things are this defined, it takes time. There is no way around the fact that it just takes a lot of time. And there are, you know, there is concept art out there and there are speed paints that you can watch where people establish a lot of stuff very quickly. And they have, it only works for certain kinds of art in certain t ways. But for a lot of stuff like this, yeah, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 hours. I mean, it just takes a lot of time. I mean, like these things over here, if they didn't take 40 hours or more, I'd be kind of surprised. I mean, like this is so well refined. I mean, it, it has to take multiple days for most people. Um, so yeah, as you, as you do it more and more, that's going to come down and we can talk about a couple of things to speed up the process but the main thing is what everybody says which is experience the more you do it the faster you'll get and if you get this down to even half that speed i i'm going to say that you're working quick i mean if you can do this in 20 hours that's impressive so I wouldn't beat yourself up for that. You're doing what you need to do, which is focusing on the quality. And once you get comfortable producing that quality, you will be able to do it quicker the next time. You'll get more used to the process and you won't do as many variations because you'll recognize the good, you know, the good idea. You'll be able to trust your judgment. And I think you do have good judgment. Uh, by the studies that you've done and which study you chose and the colors that you experimented with and which colors you chose, it all shows that you have good intuition. And as you begin to trust that more, it won't be right every time, but I think it's going to be right most of the time. And you won't have to question yourself as often. So, okay. Uh, some of the things about speeding it up main one experience number two lighting there is a direct correlation between how long a piece takes and how you light that piece and the more well lit your character is the longer it's going to take to paint it so you see in a lot of images like this one and this one and this one, these all use shaded characters. They all have ambient light on the majority of the character with a backlight or rim light. Why? Because you're automatically reducing the amount of values that you have to paint. 
If you put something in direct light, a la this, then you have a much wider value range that you have to render for every single thing. Everything has to have specular light, highlight, lights, medium, darks, cast shadows, where if you come up here, you don't. Everything is just under soft light, much smaller value range, much smaller um, color range, and it's just quicker to paint. So, uh, that is one way that you can save a lot of time. And people do it a lot because of that. Uh, number three, uh, C is process, uh, front or back load. If, and I, I think you did this correctly, but I'll just mention it for those who didn't. When you backload a piece, that is, you wait till later in the image process to answer critical questions, then it's usually going to make the entire thing last longer. It's going to take longer to paint. But if you front load the process where you're answering as many critical questions as early as possible, it will make things go eventually faster. So doing your value studies, your color studies, uh, you know, your composition studies and running through those real quick to get, before you get into your proper painting. Although it slows it down, it front loads it and slows down the front process, it speeds up the later process. And that sort of approach is one way that you can, you know, save time overall. Next up, uh, crucial references. Gathering references is very important. Uh, you know, I say that all the time, but there are some times where you don't need references. If you, you know, you know, if Martin is comfortable painting uh, a wing without reference, then don't waste the time going to get the reference. If he really can do it fine without it, then just do it without it. But if he knows that, man, you know that helmet, I. I could probably spend two hours trying to get that helmet right, or I could, go, you know, spend 20 minutes and go find some references. Well, go find the reference. And it's finding the references that are for the critical things, the things that are going to save you the most time. If it's going to take 20 minutes to save you two hours, that's a good investment of your time. Your time is one of your resources. So, where do you want to spend it? How do you want to spend it? If you're going to spend 30 minutes finding a reference for the, the little, you know, cloth, but you think you could paint the cloth in 30 minutes and be happy with it, then just paint the cloth. No reason to double up your time. So, that's just experience. You start making that. Uh, variation numbers. You usually, when you're starting out, you will do a lot of variations, a lot of composition studies, a lot of value studies, a lot of color studies. And the more that you do, you'll still do them, but you'll probably end up doing less of them. Uh, you won't need to do as many variations before you find one that you like. And again, that's one of those fluctuations. Most of the time, you, you will over time get to where you need less of them, but on a piece to piece basis, that might fluctuate a lot. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, YouTube just changed my screen back here for some reason, wasn't sure why. Just making sure we were still getting feed. Okay, cool, whatever. All right, uh, now moving on, number three. Number three, something that's, uh, we're talking about minor things here, Martin, because this is a successful image. And what we're talking about are adjustments. Nothing strikes me as like inherently wrong, but it could probably be improved, a couple of things. Uh, one is the sword. I had mentioned the sword would be better in her hand than at her side. I do like to see it in her hand, but she hasn't in a very eh, weak position. 
with it pointing down at her feet, curved, you know, tilted in. And that's not a very dominant way to hold it, and it's not one that really serves the composition well. So I would suggest turning it more like that. Uh, this way we are making more use of this wonderful triangle that you've got going on. Now you've established the triangle with the fabric on each side and with the crow. And what we can do is use the sword, instead of the sword countering our wonderful triangle, we can use the sword to add to the triangle so that our eyes are led right up to Missy right here. All right, cool. Well, that would be one adjustment. Uh, number three. Number four, the lighting. Now, the lighting is, I think, mostly, again, mostly successful. Successful. But... <laughs> Anna, well, yeah, 2 a.m. It's time to get to bed. You can watch the rest of it later. Thanks for joining in. I'm glad you're able to watch. Uh, but it feels like it's kind of split between what you're wanting out of this. Like there's light coming off of her hand, but it's not real bright. It's not doing as much work as I would anticipate it to do on other parts of the image. And... I would think, I can't remember which layer I had on what. So, you know, one idea is to have it coming from the top because you have this bright light coming down here. But then we also have the hand light. And I think that we need to push one or the other and that would give us more. Here I'm pushing this warm light back here a little bit and allowing that to break. Right now it's sort of just right here on this one side. I think it'd be nice if some of the warmth broke across behind her and some of the flares and, you know, lit smoke kind of filtered off that way. That would be nice. And then we could have more of the light up here running along the top of those items. And then that light would also hit the back, back here, and maybe some of, you know, the fabric back there. Another option and something to think about is how this bright light is playing off of the metals. Because it's playing off the skin than it is more than the metals, and the metals feel quite dull. So if we were to pop some of the, uh, the sheen on those metals to reflect that bright light, uh, I think that can pop it up a bit. And don't be afraid of letting this get brighter. That hand can be much closer to white or even white. Uh, as long as there's a nice, you know, blue bright tone along the edge of it. So something on that lines. So that's kind of cool, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, on this, all we're getting really is the specular lights from the light source. Where it's bouncing back the light at almost 100% of the brilliance uh, with a bit of that blue. So we're just looking for areas that are the closest uh, to the object of pointing at the object, uh, the light source. And so we've got those, yeah, hitting those there. Uh, next up, uh, we could also do this sort of thing where we have the glow, right? There's just kind of a soft glow that is on a hard light layer is what I used for that. And a small adjustment I would make down here is letting more of uh, him be visible. Like we just have the head right now. It feels like the head's kind of floating up. But maybe we also have this hand. And we kind of have the hand starting to, to reach up. He's picking his arm up. And that way it doesn't just feel like a floating head. That we get a bit more of the body to go with it. And, you know, it doesn't have to be connected all the way. Maybe it's like the hand here. And it starts fading out to the elbow. And then we just have a bit more of that here. All right, so we're, we're kind of connecting a bit more of it as it's coming up. Yeah. Uh, some little extras that might be nice is you've established this crow pattern in the image, which is good. I like the significance of the crows. But if you're going to put some back here, I'd say let's run with it. All right, there's, there's no problem running with it. 
So we toss, we toss some more crows back here. We let some of them be bigger. You know, that one could even be bigger than that. Or it could even be slightly in front of her, right? It could overlap her and be, uh, you know, up here like this. And so she's coming. She's got like this flock of them behind her. Uh, small change here to add a bit more, um, you know, interest to the crows. How about this one talking? You know, you have his little mouth open. And she, this crow, maybe the crows go down and they land on the people that she needs to collect. And they call out like, this one, this one. And so she comes over to the ones that the crows mark for her. And so he's, he's calling out. I don't know, maybe you see their little tongue sticking out? Yeah. Um, I would adjust this fellow, though. His angle is just a little too weird. Um, I think this is supposed to be crow, but the face is like so squished. And also it kind of bucks against our, you know, dynamic here that I would think about turning his head so that he's looking up at her. And that way that, you know, it follows our uh, kind of triangular dynamic there. Uh, but you still have him in the foreground, right? He, he can still be big. And maybe show just a bit of his body right there so that we kind of, you know, understand that he's close to the camera and that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, Martin, this is a wonderful piece. Uh, what I'm talking about is, you know, 5% change. Oh, yeah, uh, with, the, uh, <clears throat> with the crows would also be... Uh, throwing in some little orange embers that are a bit larger and some stars in the background and letting the stars have a bit more color so you have a nice blue tone right and then maybe you have more of kind of a cyan tone inside of that and then you have a brighter tone there in the middle and you let those be in varying sizes, right? So you have some that are just kind of simple little ones that don't have the bright in the middle. And then you have some that have a bit more glow to them. And just those little pops of color in the background can be nice. That sort of thing. <clears throat> um, we could dial down some of the warmth down here a little bit. I think it's okay if that just we we keep some of it, but just let it edge back. It's almost it's getting a little too close to the uh, the blue vibrancy, but if you wanted to pop some of the warmth, uh, you know, over on this side would be the place to do it. You know, catching it kind of over here, and then maybe just have a bit more of specular light, so the light isn't as overall as bright but it is catching some little specular spots here or there yeah. yeah uh yeah and listen you know i'm just throwing out some things but i'm also i mean as much as i know i'm just one dude so you know, if there's other people giving you comments that you like or if other people saying stuff on the, uh, you know, Facebook group, listen to what they have to say. Um, you know, people coming from at all different angles, and I'm, I'm not the only one with the ideas around here. So listen to what they have to say. Uh, the crows, you could be running from silhouette or you could have, like, you know, moonlight sort of thing, you know, catching the, the tops of them, depending on, uh, you know, what you're looking for. You can be doing that sort of thing. But uh, I think she's a cool character. I, he's a good good character. He's working along. I think it's all working. So, wonderful piece there. Okay, Nick. All right, Nick Priem says, uh, if you would like an actual full coverage helmet, I will fix that. Uh, no, I'm fine with this one, Nick. This is, I mean, I, it doesn't have to be a helmet helmet. This is more, uh, you know, decorative. That's fine. 
Uh, and you say, uh, having difficulty with the foreground Viking. So let's start by saying this is a drastic improvement to your concept piece. And you were really listening and you made a lot of effort to put in a lot of changes in a fairly short amount of time. And I applaud you for that. And it can be difficult to put in that much change and accept that kind of feedback, but you did. And I wanna say congrats, congrats. Uh, and that's, it's a good show from you. And I appreciate seeing that. And I, and this is a much stronger piece, I think, for it. So she is much more Valkyrie-like now. Uh, she looked a lot more like a dark witch last time. Is that face reference Cynthia Shepard? Yes, I believe it is. And, okay, so the thing, like you're saying, having difficulty with the foreground Viking, uh, my first thought is, okay, so where is the Viking reference? Where's your pose for your Viking? Where, 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 are the, where, where be the references for the dude? Uh, because if we don't have that, then that's probably a good reason you're having difficulty with it. And, I mean, on the whole, I get the idea. Guy, dead, face down, in water. Okay. I get it. Uh, the helmet feels more like a hat, just with that particular design. Uh, my suggestion would be have the guy face up or at least sideways, uh, because it is very difficult next to impossible to emotionally connect with a character that we cannot see their face. All right. So it feels more like she killed this guy, stabbed this dude in the back than it is that she's coming to, you know, welcome his soul. So instead of feeling like this guy just got sniped from the back let's maybe turn him over or have his head you know face where we can you know see it half of his face and that would be better uh martin says uh, thanks a lot clint i will be all the weekend with this very happy with the changes super cool man good good i'm glad you uh, found it helpful and yeah, absolutely. Make sure that you put the finished piece up on the group. I, I think everybody would like to see it. And yeah, the, it's a good one to put in your portfolio. I think it shows a great set of skills. You're doing good. Okay, now, uh, aside from the Viking, I'm, I'm not going to say too much about it because I don't have too much to go on. I think the, the general look of it is straightforward. I'm, I'm getting what you're saying. Let's see if we can't turn his back into his chest and then have a, a face reference and it'll be much more clear that he's a viking if we can get you know the viking beard and uh, a viking sort of helmet um that's that's more maybe more stylized than what we have here uh number three well, this is just kind of a talking point i don't think it's necessarily the biggest point on the image but let us start here by saying uh perspective now, we corrected a lot, I say we, you, I pointed out some things and you made a lot of perspective changes uh, on the character and making it more cohesive with the overall scene. But we have the issue with the wings, All right? So the wings are not following the same perspective as the rest of the scene. So this is something that comes up quite a bit when people are painting wings or uh, big helmets that have stuff sticking off of them or also horns and let's uh, perspective guides so what you can do what you can do i will walk through this instead of just showing that to you i'm going to make some lines here I'm gonna just use my line tool and I'm gonna make some lines. And these don't have to be, you know, a certain distance from each other. I'm just making sure that we have a group of them. Uh, okay. 
and then I'm going to skew it. So this one wants to stay where it is because it's already flat at the horizon line and I'm trying to create guidelines for the perspective. But what I want is to look at the angle of these shoulders, assuming that her shoulders are about flat. And I want to drop this top one until, yeah, I'll make that a little taller. I want to drop this top one until this line starts to mimic the angle of the shoulders. And I think that's getting pretty close. That seems about the angle that that upper body is at. And that seems about the angle that the, uh, the waist is at. So I'll call that good for now and do that. I'll set that opacity down a little bit and we can zoom up on here. Now this is the perspective that the body is at. It is also the perspective that the wings need to be at. So if I were to get the wings and copy and paste them, which I've already done, we would get something a bit more like this, where the bottoms would both need to align to the same level. They'd both need to start at the same level. They both would have the bend at about the same level. Those are off a little bit. Uh, then they both, you know, have the, the tops at the same level. And you can see that the difference that makes, that this one actually use a counter perspective, where it's going opposite to. But that's also just partly accurate. We actually want to get it more accurate than that because what we're thinking about is only one plane. We're treating it as if it's going completely sideways. As if this was a plane, right? Well, we'll just call this a plane. I'll just put it in four so you can see that. And then we're tilting it. So now all of a sudden what we have is this. But we're forgetting about any depth to it. And that's what we need to deal with. Uh, that wasn't as good. So here, if we think about this, we can move in here. Now, uh, again, I guess I could start from scratch so it makes more sense. Which one is that on there? Okay. Give me, yeah, the blue ones. Yeah. So if we were to create a box with her in it, and then we'll call this red box. And this red box is going to be, we're ignoring any kind of vertical perspective right now just to simplify things. Like this. And say that she is, uh, you know, kind of fitting in this box. And this is going to have a perspective going back somewhere along this. I'm just eyeballing this. Um, since it's a three-quarter view, it's going to have approximately the same perspective uh, angle going backwards as it has the other way. I'll just say it goes off that direction. Now, say that that goes across her back, and that these wings are coming out of the center of her back. Her neck's coming down here. Her shoulder blades are meeting about there. The wings are going to originate about here. Well... That means that, oh, actually, I want to move that up here a little bit. Yeah. That means that this, we can put this towards the middle. This is, needs to go back, right? The wings aren't just going sideways. If we have a top view. This is probably a better way to explain it. I'm making it too complicated. Top view, she's looking this way. All right, shoulders, wings. The wings don't do this, All right? The wings do this. So we want to make sure that we're having this depth as they go back. So if we have our box, we can think that, sure, the wings start about here, but they start at this level, but they have to go backwards, right? So if that comes back to here, then 
then that one actually comes back to here. All right? So what you have in the end is if this one is doing this and coming up, oh, I keep grabbing that accidentally. Oh, put that in there. Then this one is actually going to be like over here behind her. Most of this wing is going to be there because it's going to be going off at a three quarter. All right, so she is standing. Here we go. This is a this is a better way to show it. She's standing in a three-quarter view to us. We're here, camera. We're looking at her. She's standing in a three-quarter view. The wings are coming off at a 45. So we're looking straight down that wing, and this wing is almost flat to us. Right? Yeah, that makes more sense. And a lot of times the wings will kind of curve back in a little bit. So we could actually see the feathers on the back side coming out down there, where this one ends up being almost flat to us as those are coming out there. So it's kind of complicated, but hopefully that makes sense. Uh, when you start thinking about the perspective with the depth going on there, it gets kind of odd, but it's really, really cool when you can get it right and it really gets the depth right. So anyway, a little, uh, little study on that. Three, number four. Uh, this, these are good colors, right? These are good colors. I, I think that's working overall, but we need some references on that. I'm getting the idea that they're supposed to be clouds, but these, they're, they're, they're too perfect. They're, it's not a natural flow. So uh, it, just Google just google for like sunset cloud photo and you'll find 3.5 million of them and you, you could probably find something pretty close to that and just you know look at the shapes follow some of the shapes add those in there that'll help a lot um number one uh last one five five is the overall lighting that she is lit independently Independently from any of the light sources like her legs are really bright but what light is making her legs that bright so I'm thinking it's fine to have that as the light source but we also need to add a shadow so if that's a warm light it's probably going to be a cool shadow maybe something like this maybe something even darker than that Remember, white in shadow can be darker than black in sunlight. And we'll just shade this for now. I mean, it's not the right location, but yeah. bothering me I've got to fix it now <laughs> it's gonna be something like that <laughs> and then even this water is going to pick up some of that uh, spirity light there. Uh, make sure that the water's not too perfect, right? We're going to have some ripples. 
I think if I like those some breeze, some texture out here, right? Uh, and we can have some distance and some atmospheric depth going back there. And one of the cool things about clouds is that they're translucent, which means a lot of times you will have clouds that are lighter on the bottom. The light will penetrate through the cloud, and it's actually the edge that will get the darkest. And it's the inverse of what we talked about earlier, right? Where you have the, uh, the cylinder, right? Where... Uh, You see the most uh, stripes along the edge where it's getting foreshortened. And the same thing with the cloud. You see the most cloud stuff at the edge. And so it actually gets darker there. But you see through it more and the light penetrates through it more so that you can get um, inside glows. So they get lighter on the bottom. And get darker as they go up. Anyway, I'm painting some, I'm painting some uh, clouds on the squirrel image I'm doing right now. So yeah. Uh, anything else? Uh, no, I think that does it pretty good. Uh, I mean, you can mess around with the lighting here too. It's like you can make that maybe a little brighter back there, and then probably darken this up, um, letting her go be a bit more shadow as that goes down. Anyway, we'll wrap it up there on that one. Tyler Vell is up next. And starting on his, number one, he says, uh, I was struggling a bit with the background on this painting. Any feedback on my fundamentals will be extra appreciated. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about the background and maybe some ideas how you could approach this. And... This is a complicated scene, or could be a very complicated scene. You got a lot of stuff going on here. So what can we do in order to simplify this, speed this along, or maybe even add a bit more realism to it? Uh, here are some of the things that I would think about doing. Number one is let's find some pictures that can maybe speed us along a little bit. Not necessarily that we're trying to do photo bashing, but they can establish some quick colors, palettes, lightings, that sort of thing, and then we can manipulate that as we need to. Yeah, that was one photo. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so what I did was I selected uh, the background and I masked out uh, the two characters, the spirit and the uh, Valkyrie. And then I grabbed some photos from Google and put them into the mask of that selection like this. So here is a photo of, disable it for a second, a fire, right? A fire burning some field or woods or something. And then I put the mask on it and there we go. So now we have, yeah, there we go. There's like the hill back there. You could even have a hill back there. That's not bad. You can kind of see the line. Um, so yeah, that gives you a realistic, you know, fire scene back there. Or you could combine that with, you know, some some heavenly light coming down. And that was, I just searched for God rays and set that to lighten and, and put that up there. All, you know, same mask as well. So that shows up there. And that can give you some quick things to work with and be like, okay, I kind of like that. Oh, I don't, I don't like this light over here. There's no reason for that to be there. Um, but, but, you know, that gives me something to work with. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, I mean, you could do like this one. You can apply the same sort of thing to, you know, that one if you liked that approach. And we could put that in there as well. So it depends what colors you like. Maybe you don't like that. Maybe something like this. But that would give you a quick start on establishing 
those. I'm going to try to open up a folder down here. Yeah, okay, so uh, I have some photo bashing stuff that I purchased, photos that you can use for photo bashing. Uh, I picked up one from uh, photobash.org, not a sponsor, but really good products. So uh, Medieval Infantry. This one could save you a halluva amount of time. So somebody's gone to a Renaissance fair or reenactment or something and took all these photos of these infantry dudes and cut all the backgrounds out of them. This is what you need to save you a lot of time. So what I did was, I think I grabbed this one and I put it in here. So what we want to do I'm going to uh, yeah. I'm going to paint out some of this. I'm going to grab that smoky color. I still want that there. I'm just going to soften out some of that. That's fine. And then I can grab these guys. But I'm just grabbing their silhouette. So I'm grabbing that shape of them. And then... I'm still going, right? Okay. The chat has it updated a little bit. I, I don't know if people are just listening or if there's no one there. <laughs> so I've grabbed the shape of them. And then what I can do is just come in with whatever color I want. And just pull out their silhouette like that. Ta -da! And then I can grab somebody else. So I have these guys be like, uh, I'm more concerned. I just kind of want their silhouettes, right? So maybe I want these guys back here. So I'm going to grab their shape. And then I'm more concentrated on just pulling out the top. I just want the top of their uh, silhouette there. And then they can get lighter as they go down. <clears throat> or you can have them in there, but what you do is, in this case, it's very sepia toned, so we can sepia them. And then we could come in here and do a blur, smart blur, because we want to get rid of a lot of the detail. We don't want it nearly that detail rich. And then we can lower their opacity down to, I don't know, 20% or so. And, and then you start building up your layers. Like we can do the same thing for these guys, right? Get to lower them down. And this is kind of a concept art approach, but you could establish layers of these guys very quickly, just inside of 30 minutes, you could bring in a bunch of them. And that would be a really good start to them. And it would keep things nice and crisp, kind of like what we have here. And then if you want to, you can come back in on your you know, normal layer and maybe you start pulling out some, some lights, right? You start painting like, okay, I wanna, I wanna bring it the sheen on this a little bit. I want to make this metal instead, so that's going to have more of a sheen to it. Or what you could do is come in behind these characters and maybe add like a like a linear dodge and have a... I'm selecting the inverse of them. There we go. And you have like a fire glow, right, between some of the layers. Yeah. 
and that, that's how you could start to establish that sort of thing. Uh, and the same thing, we could find uh, some of the guys in here uh, that you would like as a reference for some of your foreground guys. That might not be the right pose that you like, but you could look at the fellow and be like, oh, okay, well, I kind of like the way that his helmet looks or his clothing or whatever and kind of adapt it to what some of these guys are doing. But that would get you started. Uh, what else? Up next, uh, number two. Oh, yeah, number two. Oh, talking about the skeleton. The skeleton uh, felt a little off to me. So, if again, this was another time that I just kind of stood in that pose, just thinking if I if I was flying, I was holding this dude. Um, naturally, my body would want to <clears throat> make this arm go out further in order to counter the weight of this guy, and I. Your, your body wants to throw them. If you have more weight over here, especially with that spear, you, you want to get it further away from your body to offset the weight of this guy that you're picking up. So that's going to be moved out further on that side. And also, it felt like to me that it'd be more natural for this knee to pull up, the knee opposite of the arm going down. I'd be pulling up with that knee um, so that the hips and the shoulders are opposite, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so you, you could check that yourself. You could play that out and see whether that seems natural to you or not. But I would suggest doing that. And next up, let's pull up to the head. Uh, a lot of the face is pretty accurate. Um, I don't know if you looked at anything th for that or not. But I went to a 3D site, uh, Sketchfab, found a, a model, and turned it to where it was about the same angle as what you had. Uh, one of the things that I realized was the, the head is too far back. If you pick your head up that much, your chin naturally comes forward more. Where we have the chin coming backwards, where it probably needs to come forwards more more like over here the face needs to be forwards um but the rest of the the rest of this is pretty pretty much right except for the head the top of the head so let's lower the opacity down kind of match these up those would be about there Okay, so that's pretty close. But what you see is, you know, the eyes are here, the eyebrows are here. The top of the head is right here. And most of the head is all underneath because of that extreme angle. And what we have is a lot of the head still being up here. All right. So we've got to move that down so that that looks like it's actually sitting on the head. Because the head and the helmet are at two different angles. And this has to sit squinch down. That there's this very, very little brow, you know, room there. So something more like that for this top piece. But then you have to realize that these aren't going sideways, they're going back. So what is actually happening here is that If you think about the, the axis kind of like if it was on a, you know, a block. The, uh, no, I don't need 40%, thank you. Um, 
the wings on the sides are right now going straight up. In order for them to go at the right angle, they're actually doing this. They're going down there. They might arch up and then come down, but something more on that angle. Okay. Uh, yeah, the blue, the blue is a little odd. I'm going to just mention that. That'll be the last thing I mention on this one. Uh, there is no other blue in the scene. Uh, and it doesn't connect him to her. It doesn't connect her to Valhalla. It doesn't connect the spirit to the man. It, it doesn't connect anything to anything. And so it's just kind of an odd choice. And... I think we need to connect it to something. Like even if yeah, even if she had blue wings, it would connect her to him. Or if her garment was blue, or whether she had silver armor that had more of a bluish sheen to it, or whether the light coming down on her was bluish. Uh, or if all the light down here is warm, except for the light down on around this particular dude is blue. And maybe there's a bright blue light up here, like on top of the, the wings. Otherwise, maybe making his spirit like a golden color, so that the whole thing is more analogous uh, within the same family of colors. Okay, very good, Tyler. Think you're doing good. Keep it going. William, you are up at 1.40 a.m. in England. You're like, Clint, why don't you hurry up? I need to go to bed. It's almost 2 a.m. Sorry, man. Here we go. Uh, let's turn off the guidelines. Cool. Um, you said, uh, I've learned not to ignore things that are bothering me. <laughs> Such as the wolves, which I was never happy with. Overall, I'm happy, but would love uh, input on any issues. Okay. Uh, the wolves are much better. I went ahead and grabbed the uh, concept piece that you had submitted so we could just see the uh, before and after there. So the wolves feel like they are much more aggressive. Uh, we've got the snarl to them. They've got more cuts. Uh, we've got the, you know the slices in them the arrows in them showing that they got killed having the mouth open the tongue out it's much more clear what's going on the feeling here so cool stuff and i think that's good uh you haven't changed the scene itself that much like everybody's in the same place um you've changed like you know gave that guy a bow uh, you know, change the wolves, but majority of the stuff is staying in the same place. Uh, number two, uh, I need to turn that one back off. Number two, you adjusted her, um, gave her more like chain mail. Okay, that's fine. But the chain mail right now is running this really brown greenish color that doesn't really mesh with anything because this scene is very blues and violets and peaches and you've got this kind of brownish greenish color that's kind of odd so i would suggest adjusting that and i'm going to just use a overlay layer And try to take it back more to uh, a silver tone. It'll set better in your overall color scheme. All right. I guess not up there, down here. Something more like that. Um, it's kind of a smaller thing, but also on this, just the hanging uh, chain mail like that seems kind of odd. Uh, if anything, we just throw an extra belt around here. She could have some loose belts down there, and they could just have a little gold uh, fastenings on them. You know, cinch points. And that way, that 
it, it just kind of keeps those in stay around her. It looks a bit more like a bit of fashion. Uh, okay, uh, number three. This confuses me a little bit with this is just completely ambiguous. Like, I don't know if this is smoke or dress or, or what. Um, the issue is that not that it is immaterial, but the rest of it is presented as being very solid. And then on the dress, you're just kind of, you know, nothing. And I, I, if we're going to be like doing the fade to smoke thing, then let's start that up here where this starts fading into, you know, a smoke sort of appearance up here. Uh, and it's not just a sudden thing down there. Or just make it a proper physical dress hanging there. And I don't think there's any problem with that. That's fine. Uh, Mamet says, uh, Swatches, when the tickets go on sale again for the next challenge, uh, the six tickets should go up for sale about midday tomorrow, around noon, uh, Central Standard Time. And uh, then six more at approximately midnight tomorrow, my time. Uh, so yeah, I'm with the uh, the ethereal nature. Let's lean it either making it more ethereal through more of it, or just give her a proper, full, you know, tangible dress. Okay, next number three. We got three twice. Okay, anyway, <laughs> number three. Um, the lighting here. I think the lighting and the values are where. You're kind of getting stuck the most and also where you could probably get the most out of it because I like the characters. I like the scene. I like the arrangement, the composition, and I think all those things are reading quite well. And the character designs are completely acceptable. Um, but yeah, like things are getting a bit muddled. And a lot of the similar values, similar colors are just not popping off of each other the way they need to. So some of that is due to the lighting being kind of unfixed. Like we've got the lighting back here. And I think that's good, like having this in shadow and having that, you know, light coming out from behind the heel. That's fine. And we're establishing the light coming from this direction with this being in shadow as if the light is coming, you know, this way. Okay, cool. Then why is the light hitting this person's face? Why is the light hitting this person's face? If the light, if we're establishing that the light is behind here, how is anything over here getting any direct light? And we can play loose with it with the ambient light and we can maybe make the ambient light a little brighter than it naturally would be but we wouldn't have direct light because there's no direct line between that object and the light source it's being blocked so we would need to adjust that uh, also uh, playing with the light here is something that is probably going to help pull out some of these shapes so for your particular style you you need to go i feel like you're kind of running between two which is you're trying to still do a lot of lifting with some of your lines but you're also trying to make sure that you're doing it with the colors as well and we, if you're going to do it with the lines, then we need to stick a lot more stuff in the mid-tones, a lighter, a bit more pastel, so the lines show up. But if it's going to be the tones and not the lines, then we need to make a lot more distinctions between the values of the objects. So let's walk through a couple of things that I pulled together. And first is I would want to pull together some references for snow and similar situations, kind of see how the lighting works. Uh, I thought that picture here, uh, this picture here, 
was a good you know representation of kind of some ideas of what's going on there uh, this I found to be a very useful piece it's one that I would probably get a lot of work out of and I adjusted a little bit so that the shadow tones were bluer than they naturally would be or the camera picked them up but this sort of distinction between things are very lit or things are clearly shadowed and the things in the shadows are very uh, blue but they also are not lost to darkness like there's plenty of value change in the shadows uh, this one is kind of cool like showing the stream that the stream is very dark uh, this is something that you could easily do on your image uh, the water isn't selling real well so something like that i mean you can add more grasses and stuff but just have you know bits of the the snow kind of there on the edges and then the water is essentially really really dark with some of the icy bits on the edge uh, this is actually a 3d render that i came across on artstation uh, by whoever this person is i flipped the image backwards but I also adjusted this so it has a bit more of the tones that you see in your scene. So this is a good representation too of, you can still get quite a bit of detail um, and, and stuff out of it. And also something to notice here is once we're getting back into the light, we're getting silhouettes a lot more with the trees. We're not getting forms as much as we're getting silhouettes. So, I think a lot of this comes down to the lighting and in order to do this better you might need to step back a couple of steps in the process I don't know how you layered your image but let me show you some tutorials that came to mind that maybe example this in a good way um, this is one approach that might work well for yours uh, Credit to whoever made these, I pulled them off of Pinterest. Uh, you can start by painting, and it applies to your image as well as, you know, this kind of cartoony piece. You can paint most of the image with your color sketch, and then you shade it. You add a multiply layer of some sort of bluish tone. You always would have a starkly blue tone, same sort of thing you have here. And it takes it all down into uh, a shadow, everything shadowed. Uh, then what you can do is you can mask, create a mask and paint it out. And anything that you paint with white becomes the light. You're letting the light shine through. And that way you have the normal scene as if it was lit with everything with its natural color. And then you add a multiply layer of blue to it. And then you can paint out the blue with a mask so that the light shines through and you can kind of pick and choose where you want the light to go and i think it'd be fine if you know i think this is good like most of this is going to have light coming across back there because it gives them wonderful silhouettes okay good good but we could also treat it as if the light was coming more downwards and not necessarily from over the hill because we probably want some light on these guys. So maybe the light's coming down kind of like this. And there's just no trees out there. So the light's coming down and it's catching all this area. But there is trees over most of this area. So most of it's shaded. Except for... <laughs> the guy with his motorcycle out there startled me. Uh, but there could be a light here. Lighting this guy up. And we probably want a light falling across some of the wolves here and then maybe over this kid right here because that would allow him to have a brighter tones against the darker cave and then that way your your you know your tones work better that way your overall values and it would simplify the way of trying to like paint something light paint something shadow you're you're making everything light and then you're shadowing everything and then you're pulling out and you can do it one way or the other you can paint it all shadow and, and pull out the light or paint it all light and pull out the shadow you know either way 
Uh, I use the same approach on the Jace image. Uh, Jace, Ingenious Mind Mage, where he's in the jungle. I painted that all in shadow and then added lights to it. Uh, these are some other tutorials that show similar sort of concept. Uh, I forget offhand who created these, but you can go find these on Pinterest and Google, I reckon. I don't know why motorcycles have to be that loud, but okay. Uh, so this kind of shows the same sort of idea of, you know, you start out with the base colors as you would want them, and then you paint over it with a uh, shadow tone uh, with the tint that you want, and then you have to go back and rebalance it a little bit. Okay, that's fine. Sometimes you want a, a multiply layer to do that. Sometimes you want more of an opaque layer. You would have to experiment. So you can look over those, and yep, that's cool. Uh, you know, these sorts of things like tinting them, because this has a very uh, strong tint of things in the light are very yellow and warm, and things in the shadow are very cool with your scene, I mean. I think we're getting a lot of contrast in some of this stuff that would just naturally not have that much contrast. things in the light. I want to brighten them up even more. Again, I had to start getting into thinking territory, so not talking as much. I'm not sure how many people are even in here right now. 38 people in here. Okay, cool. Uh, if we're going with more of the black water, that let's turn on our reference so that we actually have something to go with and i'll just do a little repainting on this and we'll probably be wrapping it up uh in a little bit uh i wanted the main reads to be the valkyrie and viking and the kids not so much one a bright light on the face kids more fading back push myself on this okay then we don't have to have light on the kids but we definitely want a light down here on this fellow We might have some like blue back here just to kind of separate them out a little bit. Just give a bit of color back there. Uh, do you only use Photoshop or do you use other programs for anything? Uh, I almost use Photoshop. Well, I only use Photoshop for painting. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, I don't really use other programs. And if I was going to do anything 3D, which I don't really do much at all in 3D, but that would be something else. Now on her, right now she's she's kind of the odd one out. Like the lighting isn't necessarily on her a lot. Now also like this color scheme, you're running really warm on his pants. Or we probably don't want to go that warm. Uh, I feel like the highlight on the heel compared to the mid-ground element helps here. Uh, your cam area is blocking the image, so... Oh, yeah, I forget about the cam area. Um, I'll put Photoshop up here. There we go. Let me look up here and see if that works. <laughs> look at my own video feed and see if that that's looking correct or not. Oh, come on, Navigator. There's got to be some zoom level between those two. Like, it, what one thing that they need to fix with Photoshop is that you can only... as If the canvas doesn't fit in the window, you can move the canvas around. But if the canvas does fit in the window, then you cannot move the canvas around. And I think that's ridiculous. I should always be able to move the canvas around, whether it fits in it or not. If you want to have the option, just put a little thing up here for like centering the image. So that if you get it anywhere near center, it'll snap to center. But I, I need that uh, ability to move it without having to because, like, I have to make this extra small just to be able to move it. There we go. Okay, so if we want more attention on her, And anything in the shadow is going to be super blue because blue light is going to be bouncing up. This is going to be more blue. Uh, pressing F will change the canvas so you can move it around. Uh, yeah, but then it also makes it full screen and I can't read the comments. <laughs> Uh, no, pressing F toggles between the different, uh, yeah, pressing F will toggle between the different ways to, f you know, show the canvas, but they all involved, um, taking over the entire screen so I can't see anything. <laughs>
I'm so, obviously this is super rough. I'm just trying to throw this together real fast. Uh, no, I don't need that. No, no, no. Yeah, you gotta, you've got some options on the wings. Like you can make the background, like the wings need to be in shadow, but you could make the background even darker so that the wings appear brighter. That sort of way. You feel I went away from my concept? Well, not really. But I, because the, the, the lighting on the concept is very undefined. Like it's just, it's kind of an idea right now. Um, but I, I think it's more of a style thing where I don't even feel like your style needs to be as realistic as what I normally do. I think you naturally have a better illustrative style than I do, and that yours doesn't need to be technically accurate or as technically accurate as some other people. I think yours, it, it's a hard thing to, hard thing to say, you know, do something because it looks right, because in most people's hands, that is a bad idea. But I think to a degree you need to. I think it fits your... Uh, I don't have a style. I'm completely lost with one strength. Uh, everyone has a style. I know you have a style because I can look at a piece and say, yeah, that William did that piece and Martin didn't do that piece. And that's, yeah, your style will fluctuate a little bit, but there's a way that you handle forms, a way that you lay out an image. Everything that you choose and, and don't choose is evidence of your style. And it's rarely anything that you, you choose to do meaningfully. Like, you know, the, the fact that you laid this out the way that you did is your style. The way that you, you know, chose mainly curvy forms is part of your style. The way that you've had these kids expressing is part of your style. It's just the accumulation of all the ways that you choose. When I try to do simple lines and color, it looks wrong to me or not finished, so I keep painting and painting until I think it's finished. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what most of us do. <laughs> we draw it, then we just keep painting it until we think it's finally done. Um, I think, you know, for this piece, it's finding a marriage between what's realistic and what looks good and also what feels right. Because your image is more about the heart than the realism. And when you do that, there's a bit of artistic license to it. Uh, man, I came across a piece the other day. I can't remember if I saved it or not. It had a style that it kind of reminded me of yours. I don't even remember what it was. I know I came across something. And I thought I had a really good balance between... It, it wasn't trying to be real. And I, I think that's one of the things is... I don't get the impression you're trying to be real. You're not trying to be 
photographic. So we got to be careful of trying to push you that way, uh, like this. You're not trying to do that. You know that. So we want to find a way to use the strings of what you've got. You know, even that, it's like, it's, it's very illustrative. It's not realistic, but it's, that's not the idea. Uh, they did what was right for the image. Hmm, I don't know. I'll have to, I don't remember where, what it was or where it was, but yeah. Um, It says, I'm going for a stylized realism like Line Decker or uh, a Munson type. Yeah, another thing that works well uh, is it's the sort of thing that in here it's like, okay, maybe the light wouldn't technically hit their face, but say we go with it. Okay, fine. Then let's just find ways to, to pop out some of this stuff. Like, I just feel like, you know, letting his little arm show up back there maybe no that's good you can just kind of go piece by piece and add in that's a little light the main thing here is just a lot of stuff is drifting very quickly to black and let's just watch to keep that from happening so we have a little bit more mid-tones in those and then we're just looking for spots that we can pull out, like, you know, some of the brightness on the, the face against some of the darkness and maybe the water. An example, I want to draw a flower in this place. Okay, it looks like somebody's talking to each other. All right. Um, Yeah, I don't know that you need to go with, like, a lot of realistic lighting. I would be interested. I think maybe yours would work better if you did, like, just more mid-tones. Let your lines show through. Uh, then you can pop some bright lights here or there. Yeah. I was trying to think of some artists that use strong shapes without, and, and again, like this is a wonderful, wonderful image, but it's not even pretending to try to be real. And, you know, it has a bit more of that line decker feel, that kind of that older style. And it's an excellent way to approach it. Uh, can I send a link? Uh, what's the link for? You can try to post it. I'll have to okay it. What's the link for? Uh, Rigney, Hughes, no, nope, Donato, no, Quang Ho. Oh yeah, the classic, like classic painting. <laughs> Even Jesper isn't too far off of like what you do. Um, you know, like this sort of thing. He does a lot of classic paintings. And, you know, that I think would even work for you pretty well too, something on this lines. Because he has such good line work and good shapes that it's a strength to his images that a lot of people don't have. And I think that you go that direction as well. And it has enough realism that you can understand the forms and it has a lot of depth to it. But 
Yeah, he's not trying to do what a lot of other people are doing, which is this sort of photorealistic, hyperrealism, you know, fantasy images. And something on this line could be really good for you. Yeah, something like that. Good pops of color, but letting the shape still do a lot of the work. Now, he doesn't use a lot of complex lighting. There's usually one main bright light coming from one direction and a bit of fill light on the other side just to keep things from going to black. And that's what he uses most of the time. Bright light back there, fill light, ambient light on the other side. And yeah, yeah, he has wonderful colors and runs with simple defined color schemes. Of course, he's doing these in oil paintings. Oils or acrylics. Oils, I think. Maybe acrylics. And so like analogous color scheme. Analogous color scheme. And he's keeping a lot of these are analogous. Sometimes he, you know, he's going with the, the opposites. He's got like the blue and the orange uh, running with the violet there. So he's kind of has a triadic thing going on over on this one. Um, but again, very clearly defined, very illustrative. And I thought he uses watercolor. Uh, oh, if it's, it's, you know what? On this, it, it looks like gouache. Gouache is like opaque watercolor. It's a little too thick for watercolor, but it's probably gouache. Yeah, that's his name if you haven't looked him up. Apparently, it's like Jesper Easing, Essing, where half of his letters are silent. <laughs> uh, keeping a traditional wouldn't be a bad idea. What I would suggest, uh, Will just said that, I would suggest doing some color studies with digital because you can work through more variations faster digitally and just do like a four up. Do like like four of them, put them in a screen do, and do, okay, if I do, you know, analogous color scheme, if I do you know, split complementary color scheme, that sort of thing, and try different ones, figure out how you're going to handle the colors uh, then do your little color study, and then you can do your final. Um, if you haven't tried it, what you could also do is if you have the lines, if you've already drawn up the lines the way that you want them, and they're digital, then you can have them printed on a canvas or uh, watercolor paper, and uh, then you can paint on that so you don't have to redraw them all. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking this sort of approach would be much more your thing than necessarily the way that I paint. Um, and naturally, that, you know, I, that's what I know, so that's kind of the way that I direct people. But I don't want to push you that way. So, yeah. Okay, well, it, it's much too late already, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um... So anything that I need to cover beforehand. Uh, next week, I should be having a new Vibrant stream. I canceled the one last week. Uh, that's because I had worked the previous week and worked through that weekend and then worked that whole week. And I was just kind of, I was worn out. I just needed some time off. Um, it was just one more thing that I, <laughs> it's like I, I don't need that on my plate right now. So hopefully, plan is next week we'll have a new uh, Vibrance episode with a live stream where I take questions, and then we will have our, uh, you know, in two weeks we'll have the concepts for the next challenge, the Owl and the Sword. And tickets should be going up for sale tomorrow. I'll try to announce on the Facebook group the exact time when those will be available. So... Thank you, everyone, who took the time to join in, everyone who watched this. I know it was a really long stream, but hopefully you've enjoyed it.
and you know learn something from it if you want to help support the stream and also get uh, your you know hands on the new materials coming out please come over and join the patreon um, if even you know two percent of the people on the facebook group would join the patreon i could do swatches full time uh, but right now we're not. We're like half of a percent. Uh, if we get two percent, I could just put everything into working with you guys. So there we go. That's the numbers. Thanks for joining. I will catch you guys later. Until then, keep drawing.